Today I'm hosting Miad Nahavali, an Iranian researcher who recently obtained his PhD thesis from the Faculty of Political Science of the University of Belgrade. And we are here to talk about the current political situation in Iran, the prospects of improving the relationship with the West, Iran's role in the region of the Middle East, but also past and present role in the Western Balkans. Mied Nahavali obtained his PhD at the Faculty of Political Science, University of Belgrade. Currently, he is an associate researcher at the Belgrade Center for Security Policy. Mied is engaged in the analysis of Middle Eastern political issues. The main fields of his interest are Iran's relations with the USA and with Saudi Arabia. Miad also has more than five years of experience in the field of migration. He served as a child protection officer and cultural mediator at the United Nations Refugee Agency and Save the Children. He currently works in a risk management intelligence company as a database analyst and as a team leader in company that is engaged in IP-related information for Iran and Afghanistan. So, Miad Jan. Welcome to the Lighthouse podcast of the Belgrade Center for Security Policy. Over the last two months, we saw renewed protests in your country. Can you tell us what's going on in Iran? Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, over the past two months, there are again uh, numerous protests in the cities of Iran. Uh, we know that the Iranian moral police has arrested a Kurdish girl called Mahsa Amini because she was wearing her hijab improperly. She was taken to the custody and after a while she passed away uh, in the custody. Uh, although the Iranian authorities are claiming that she passed away due to her historical, uh, to the, to the uh, uh, medical, medical, condition. Yeah, medical condition and heart attack, but of course the Iranian public doesn't believe that and they believe that she was tortured and killed by the uh, moral police. Right now, there are again uh, numerous protests in the cities of Iran. We saw different protests in uh, universities. Uh, we are also witnessing um, different strikes in uh, industrial sectors. And once again, I think um, Iranian people are trying to show their dissatisfaction to the very hardcore of the Islamic Republic. Uh, as we can see that, um, unfortunately, uh, there is a huge gap between the society and the Islamic regime. And uh, we see that uh, the Islamic Republic actually uh, doesn't claim that the, the problem is real and they're calling the protesters the Western puppet, or they call them that. I don't know. They were manip they were manipulated by the West, and uh, something really from the authoritarian yeah, playbook yeah, because exactly. we hear this here as well yes, often. Yes, yeah, yes. Right. But uh, how are these protests different from the ones in 2019, 2020, 2020, 21, and but even the earlier ones like the 2009 yeah. Green Movement yeah. protests? Uh, of course, there were numerous uh, uh, protests from the very beginning of the Islamic Republic until today. But if we go back to one or two decades ago, uh, for, in for instance, we can highlight the uh, Green Movement. Uh, green Movement or Persian Spring refers uh, to the movement when uh, Iranians once again came to the, uh, to the uh, streets to ask the government why they stole their, uh, uh, their votes, you know, uh, because the regime was trying to manipulate the result of the election and bring Ahmadinejad back to the office. So when the people uh, came out they, and they asked where are their votes, once again they were cracked down, uh, their leaders were uh, put in the house prison, and uh, the movement was, was repressed totally. Mm -hmm. But if we move forward, Again, in 2019 and 2020, there were numerous protests due to the economic mismanagement of the Islamic right. uh, Republic. And also there were protests due to the increase in the fuel price. 
uh, people were just simply asking why we are sending free fuel to Lebanon or to Shia militias in the region financing them while we still have numerous economic problems inside our own country. Mm -hmm. And we are increasing the fuel price. Uh, it, one year ago, we had another protest due to the IRGC shutting down the Ukrainian uh, air flight in Iranian space. If you remember, that was the time that uh, Iran had tension with the United States over uh, killing the General Qasem Soleimani in Iraq. Yes. So mistake, mistakenly, they have shut down the Ukrainian uh, air flight. So, but if we come to this protest, we can distinguish it from other protests. Why? Because at least in four characteristics, it's different from the other protests. First of all, due to the fact that women, for the first time in the history of Islamic Republic, started the movement and men supported them during mm -hmm. the protest. Second is the fact that almost all of the celebrities, from athletes to artists to musicians, have really supported this movement. Third is the fact that um, very influential people in the Iranian market, or traditionally saying Bazar of Tehran, mm -hmm. supported this movement. And last but not least is the fact that the young generation was the key actor during the movement. And they sort of bringing back this hope to the society once again. Right, so, so you can say um, that the social base for these protests is bigger than exactly. the previous ones. Can you say also that the fear is broken? Uh, look, fear is a very important element that is government using every time. But yeah, we can see that. I mean, when you just look what's happening uh, and you know uh, that uh, people are not anymore afraid because even right now, they're not living anymore. They're just existing. So mm -hmm. when this gap uh, is getting just you know, bigger and bigger, people are not afraid anymore. Because um, from my perspective, they have nothing to lose anymore. Right. So if we move away from the internal political situation in Iran, because nothing happens in a bubble, and we go to the international scene, so in 2018, former U.S. President Trump revoked the JCPOA, the nicknamed the Iran nuclear deal mm -hmm. that was agreed back in 2015 during the Obama administration. So what consequences did this decision have on the internal political and social dynamics in Iran? Very good question. I think... Uh it brought very serious consequence for reformist uh, spectrum in Iran. We know that Hassan Rouhani came from the uh, reformist faction in Iran, and he tied his foreign policy to the resolution of the Iranian nuclear program. And he was backed by the public. So uh, when Trump withdrew from the agreement, the first consequences was the fact that I think uh, the, uh, the reformist spectrum was pushed to the corner forever. They were attacked by the hardliner, and at the same time, they lost their legitimacy in the Iranian society. Mm. And as a result, we can see that the next administration is coming from the hardliner spectrum. Mm. And also, we can see the Iranian parliament, Majlis, is 100% fooled by the hardliners. Right. But also, we can discuss this uh, externally. Externally, I, I, I think that... Uh, Iran also uh, lost hope to collaborate with the West in, pop in general and with the United States in particular. And it's somehow getting closer to the Eastern Bloc. Yeah, but I wanted to ask you precisely on that because it seems that irrespective of whether it's led by a Republican yeah. or a Democratic administration or president, that the US perceives Iran as a threat to regional security in the Middle East. And why is this so? I think to answer this question, we have to go back to the very root of the Islamic Republic. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the Islamic Republic, 
came to power with the slogan of no to West, no to East, but the Islamic Republic mm. in the Cold War period. So he was very clear with his strategy. And at the time, he was trying to find his own third way in the world policy. And how? He tried to unify Muslims, but Shia Muslim, oppressed Shia Muslims. Mm -hmm. to go against the West, to go against the United States, to go against the monarchies in the Gulf countries. So from the very beginning, it posed a danger, not only to the region, but also to the global uh, level. And let's not forget that the whole Islamic Republic is based on the very important pillar, which is exportation of the Islamic Revolution. And still, Iran is trying to keep that policy. Look right now. Iran trying to finance its Shia militias in the region. Iran is trying to finance um, like-minded group in the region. And of course, in response, Saudi Arabia is financing uh, Shia group, Salafi groups, extreme groups in the region. And this is how uh, made the Middle East a powder keg mm. in, in the region. Mm. And what do you think that the midterm elections uh, in the U.S. will bring to this relationship with Iran? Well, I think uh, depending uh, whether Democrats or Republicans get the majority in the Congress, we can forecast the bilateral relationship between Iran and the United States. For example, if uh, Democrats get the majority, then uh, we can see that Joe Biden will have more open hand to negotiate the future of GCPOA or Iranian nuclear agreement with Iran. Um, while if uh, Republicans get the majority, we can almost forecast no future for the GCPOA and also we can somehow predict that the next president will come from Republicans. Then we know what will happen with Iran because I can see somehow that the U.S. will go on the same path that Donald Trump went, which means uh, maximum pressure, uh, more sanctions, and more alliance with Saudi Arabia and with Israel. Right. And is European policy different than that? And how is it different? I mean, if it is. I think, um, uh, of course, Iran's relationship with European countries had many ups and downs. But generally speaking, uh, I think Europeans are acting more as a mediator between Iran and the United States. Mm. For example, we see also during the nuclear talks, they were acting as a mediator between Iran and the and, and United States. They were, uh, you know, uh, transferring information as a third party and they tried to get uh, US and Iranian approach closer to each other. However, we can see that Iranian assistance to Russian Federation really uh, lead to diminution of the relation between Iran and European Union. And I think this was a mistake from the hardliners foreign Iran. policy mm. in Iran. You're talking about the procurement of the drones and so exactly. on, right? Exactly. Right. But uh, just to add, while Iranians could act as a mediator between Russia and Ukraine and at the same time find an energy market for themselves in Europe, they lost this chance. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, look, uh, Miad, uh, by now you're practically native to Serbia. You speak excellent Serbo-Croatian and, and you also know the rest of the Western Balkans region. So how would you describe Iran's role in the Western Balkans? Who are its allies? Who are its adversaries? Hard to say who are Iran's allies or adversary. I mean, at least defining it that way. But um, at least we can say with the proximity that these countries uh, have with Russia or with the United States. Or if I suppose to name, then I would say that uh, at least in the current situation, due to the proximity of Serbia and Iran to Russia and also many economical and uh, military cooperation between Iran and Serbia, we can now maybe call at least in some way Iran and Serbia are the allies in the Western Balkan. While we know that Albania has a very close relationship with um, 
enemy of Iran, United States, and Israel, so we can call uh, Albania as an adversary of mm. Iran. That, that's interesting, but I would like to go a bit deeper into this relationship with Serbia, for example, or with the Serbs in the region, because I wanted to ask you, how did Iran's role change with respect to the 1990s, for example, because we know that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, were supporting the Bosnian Muslim forces with arms, trainers for its military and security services. And even when Hezbollah reportedly even sent fighters uh, to the Bosniak forces in the war. So how did this role change and, and why did it change? Because we can see from your answer that it did. Very good question. And I think uh, to answer this, at least we have to divide two periods, early 90s and late 90s and onward. Uh, I think uh, in the early 90s, in line with the policy, Iranian foreign policy of exportation of the Islamic revolution, they came to the region. But of course, they were seeking their uh, national interests. In, uh, in the Balkans. Why? Because at that time, first of all, the Balkans uh, traditionally didn't have a very good intelligence service to recognize threats and opportunity. And second, I think Europe, at least at that time, was not that sensitive about the existence of Iran. Mm. But they wanted to come here to expand their networks here and to have a leverage on Europe for the future. Mm, interesting, yeah. But, um, of course, the IRGC, the Quds branch, which is uh, responsible for the foreign uh, uh, implementation, they came uh, to the region and they were acting as a coordinator between different militias, between Hezbollah, Al Qaeda was in the region. Uh, in in the region, mm. there were many uh, militias which uh, IRGC was financing and coordinating at the same time in Bosnia. However, with the Dayton Agreement, let's not forget that. In the Dayton Agreement, it was uh, a sentence which was uh, committing the uh, re re region to expel all of the foreign fighters. Mm. So at least we can say uh, in the late 90s, Iranian hard power was diminished from the region. They had to be removed from the Bosnian soil. Of course, there were also many Iranians in Albania and in Kosovo. So they were removed. So Iranian hard power was removed from the region. However, it's very naive that if we think that Iran lost its influence in the region. Of course, the soft power of Iran through its cultural institution, through educational institution, remained the same. So Iran just moved from the ground to the underground, at least in Bosnia. Um, but if we come forward, we see that due to the fact that Albania got so close to the United States. Bosnia also, in some way, moved toward the United States. They moved to Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Mm. So Iran almost lost its situation in Bosnia. So we saw that Iran tried to get closer to Serbia. And they have this mutual friend, which is Russia. They have this big, big brother, which is getting them closer and closer to each other. Let's not forget that Iranian uh, diplomacy really got so close with the Serbian diplomacy. In just four years ago, the uh, Serbian government decided to abolish a uh, visa regime between the two countries, which actually showed the highest diplomatic relationship between the two countries. But then they reintroduced it the year after, Of right? course, so, yeah. by the pressure of, by the, the, European pressure Union. of the European Union. Uh, exactly. Uh, we are reliving this situation <laughs> now with other countries. Uh, but. Let me ask you about Albania, though. That's interesting, because from 2013 to 2016, Albania has started to host several thousand, reportedly, of retired combatants from the People's Mujahideen Organization of Iran, the MEC, and their families. Um, can you briefly tell us maybe uh, something about this organization and the effect that uh, this fact might have on the Iranian uh, policies towards uh, Albania? Well, uh, Mujahideen was established by leftist students somewhere in 1960. So, sorry, in uh, 1960, yeah, uh, or 1963 or four. 
Um, the, uh, at least in the very beginning, the organization was claimed to be uh, Islamic, Marxist, and militant. And their main mission was to overthrow the monarchy of Shah. Mm -hmm. However, uh, with the triumph of the Islamic Republic, the leader of this organization, Masoud Rajavi, mm -hmm. couldn't get along with Ayatollah Khomeini due to the some very basic principle that they had for the future of Iran. Mm -hmm. While they were thinking that Iran should be a democratic Islamic Republic, Khomeini was emphasizing on the Islamic principle. However, very soon, this, uh, or this organization came to armed confront confrontation with the Islamic regime. Let's not forget that they blew up the Iranian parliament at the time. They mm -hmm. killed many Iranian officials. And of course, in response, uh, also the uh, Islamic Republic killed many of their members. However, in the end, uh, this organization was defeat inside, defeated inside the Iran and they had to um, go to, uh, they ran away to Iraq and to France. Mm -hmm. But um, this organization was fighting against Iran during eight year war between Iran and Iraq. And Saddam Hussein. And right? Saddam Hussein. Yeah, yeah. And they collaborated closely with Saddam Hussein. And that's the reason they have no reputation in Iranian society. Right. And let's not forget that this group was in a terrorist blacklist of the United States, Canada, Japan, Iran, and Iraq. And let's not forget that they have this very good lobby and actually, we don't know where the finance is coming from. We can speculate, but uh, we still don't know how they have that finance to have that much influence in American lobby to get off the uh, 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 blacklist. Because we saw many famous of conservative course. politicians from yeah. the U.S. speak at their rallies. And, and we know that they're paid like for one speech. But how did they end up in Albania? Uh, I think... Uh, by Iranian getting more influence in Iraq. They put more pressure on, Iranian, uh, on Iraqi government to expel this organization. Mm -hmm. So at the end, this organization uh, uh, had to leave Iraq. So in accordance with the US policy and close re uh, relationship between Israel and United States collaborating with Albania, they removed, they relocated this organization to Albania. Yeah, well, but but just if I can add please, something please. About, about this organization uh, and about the fact that they have, I mean, when people are speaking about the future of his, this organization and they're speaking about the, uh, this organization as an alternative, the idea is just crazy. Let's not forget that uh, how cruel this organization is to it, acting toward its own members. We know that there were some reports coming out that they don't uh, respect any sort of human rights, even within their organization. We know that there, there were uh, women who were forced to divorce their husband. The younger women cannot even get married. Everybody supposed to devote itself to the value of organization. So it's almost like a cult, right? Exactly. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so imagine this as an alternative for the Islamic re regime. So it's just exchanging bad for worse. Right. But according to the Balkan Insight, uh, in October 2022, Iranian hackers leaked secret files of the Albanian police. Um, is this, in your opinion, somehow related to this MEC presence in the country? I think it's absolutely related. Uh, let's not forget that when this organization was in Iraq, was in France, Iranian officials many times were sending different signals and somehow pressuring those governments to expel this organization. Iran did the same with Albania. They were sending different statements. And by the way, let's not forget that Albania doesn't have uh, any consulate or embassy in Iran, what Iran has. Mm. So they tried to maintain the embassy in order to uh, push and pressure the Albanian government to expel this organization. However, I think uh, we can... Uh, actually understand this act by two uh, definitions. First of all, I think Iranian regime tried to somehow retaliate the fact that, you know, the, the, the Albanian government hosts this organization. And second, I think they were trying to, and let's not forget that they hacked the police administration. Yes. So they were trying to get some information about these, uh, the members of the organization, the ties they have with the, with the 
with the authorities in Albania and outside of the uh, Albania. Well, Mia John, thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. Uh, we have learned a lot about Iran in general, what's going on currently, and also about the role of the country that is often referred to as a regional power, but even beyond its traditional region in our region of the Western Balkans. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll be uh, reading um, your research with great interest in the future. Thank it you. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you.